Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the fourth and penultimate of this year's Oxford Botanic Garden and Arboretum Autumn Science Lectures, sponsored by Plants People Planet. In case you don't already know me, my name is Simon Hiscock, and I'm the director of the Oxford Botanic Garden and Arboretum. And as always, it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, tonight's speaker. But before I do that, I need to go through a bit of housekeeping. Uh, first of all, this lecture is being recorded, but your camera and mic are turned off, so you are not being recorded. Um, if you would like to ask a question um, to the speaker, then please use the Q&A function at any time. Um, then we'll collate these questions and I will put them to the speaker at the end of the lecture. If you need to contact us about anything else, for instance, um, any technical issues, then please use the chat function and one of the team will get back to you um, fairly soon. The recording will be available to all attendees after the event, and we will be sharing details about how to access this via the emails that you registered with. Now, um, to tonight's speaker, and I'm delighted to welcome Jill Cowell, who is an honorary research associate at the Royal Botanic Gardens Q, where her research spans plant-fungal interactions, especially mycorrhizal symbioses, and the importance of understanding these processes, especially in ancient lineages of land plants like bryophytes and lycophytes, um, for vegetation ecology, and in the application of restoration ecology. Jill's interest in vegetation ecology began 30 years ago, um, working on urban greening projects in New York City, where she was studying for an MSc at New York University. She came to the UK in the early 2000s and obtained an RHS diploma in horticulture from Capel Manor College and subsequently worked as a botanical horticulturalist at Kew for over 10 years. During that time, she studied for an MSc in plant diversity from the University of Reading, where I was actually her external examiner. And then she moved on to a PhD um, that she completed at Imperial College, London. Jill's current research focuses on mycorrhizal fungi and how they help in carbon sequestration across meadows, broadleaf woodlands and conifer plantations to ensure the health of these communities and the soil that sustains them. These critical underground processes are the subject of Jill's lecture this evening, entitled Understanding Mycorrhizal Fungi and Their Functional Role to Facilitate Healthy Soils and Ecologically Sustainable Gardens. Jill, over to you and thank you for joining us this evening. We look forward to your talk. Unmute. Can you hear me now? Yep, all good, Jill. We can hear you. Fantastic. Okay. Thank you for the introduction and hello, everybody. And away we go. So let me just close this. Right. And so tonight we're going to talk, obviously, about mycorrhizal fungi. I'm gonna give you a little background on what they are and some research highlights um, that we're, uh, about the projects we're working on at Q. And hopefully these will inform your own garden and how you see the world below ground. So.
First, let's review our garden wisdom. Um, it's really amazing when we stop and think about how much we know just from observing the world, whether we're age five or age 85, we can recognize the difference between a rose or a daffodil, a blade of grass from a, or from a tree. And regardless of your training in horticulture or botany, when we stop and reflect, it's really amazing to see how much we already know about the plants around us. So just a quick review. Above ground, we understand there are different species and there's diversity and they may be competing or cooperating. And all of this feeds into our planting schemes and facilitating what I'm gonna call a community composition. Um, and you'll hear this idea of community over and over again in, in the talk tonight. Um, horticultural applications, again, regardless of our training, we all understand drainage is important and water. Um, pH preferences that different plants have and that soil chemistry will support different plant systems. Um, we understand uh, pruning, uh, pruning out dead wood, pruning for design, um, deadheading our roses and keeping a tidy garden. And all of our plants are affected by, by climate variables and um, seasonal changes which impact when we see our flowers and buds and fruit. Pollinators, of course, are key to many of our angiosperms. And we can't forget pests and diseases play a role in our above ground world. So all of our, our knowledge in the garden is enhanced again by what we see in the wild, our walks in the woods, our walks on a heathland, and how things grow in the wild, and, and then how that relates to what goes on in our garden. Now I wanna shift below ground. And below ground, most of us know that soil structure is important, uh, soil nutrient composition and, uh, you know, nitrogen deficits and phosphorus deficits and NPK, um, the role they play in plants. And of course, of course, a very complex world of microorganisms. Um, but it's still a bit of a black box. And then comes this idea we keep talking about mycorrhizae. Well, what are they? So mycorrhiza is really a fungus root. It's a single entity. It's, it's a mutualism, actually. And a mutualism is an ecological interaction between two species. Pretty simple. Um, but in the case of mycorrhizas, uh, they've been evolving for millions and millions of years. So now we're going to take a little walk outside, and we're walking in the Welsh countryside. Um, you know, most people see this, and I see this too. But tonight I'm going to turn our heads upside down. And hopefully by the end of this talk, you're going to begin to see these beauties underground as well. And my intention really is, is just that, that you're going to see that, um, that the mycorrhizal fungi are integral and, and integrated in our garden communities. They're directly linked to plant and soil health. And moreover, the ecosystem services they support are essential to life on earth. So very briefly, an overview of what we'll look at tonight. We're gonna to look at the ancient, the ancientness of, of these mutualisms, and the many types of mycorrhizas, their ecosystem function, community ecology, and the use in horticulture. And we're gonna bring this together into what I'm calling hort ecology. So just very briefly, our earliest preserved records from the Rhiney Chert in Scotland, which is aged, by the way, over 450 million years, show incredible ultra-structural detail of both the non-vascular and vascular plants. Uh, on the right is a diagram uh, reconstructing the sporophyte horneophytum and showing the bulbous corm-like rhizoids, corm-like tubers and the rhizoids. And um, Katie Field spoke about this in detail a couple of weeks ago to you all, whoever caught that lecture, which was fascinating. And she highlighted that we see these structures in this now uh, extinct plant um, 
in today's extent uh, lycopods. So we see these glomeromycotian and mucromycotian type fungi. And here you can see them in a little more detail um, in one of the charts. And this is important. And the, the real take home message on this slide is that these are ancient mutualisms. So let's quickly look now at the sort of big picture diagram showing mycorrhizal plant lineages. Um, you have plant development traits on the left. And, um, and just also wanted to, you to take note here of these fungal clades. These are the main fungal clades. Um, and you can see here these mucromycotina and glomeromycotina that I just mentioned uh, on the Rhiney chart um, are quite ancient. So as we go up this, this um, um, plant lineage, excuse me, you see that the fungal partners enter very early in the game. And the first ones were these haplometriopsida, which is a very early liverwort. And then as we move on up the liverworts, we get to uh, stomata and then um, the hornworts and um, the vasculature and roots and everything below the dotted red line. Um, these are all sporophytic. And then we get on to our modern plants, our gymnosperms and angiosperms, which are seed bearing. And they are partnering with all four of these fungal associates. So one thing to note is that um, quite a few of these are specific, um, especially when you come down to the, the lower land plants. And then you see that the leafy liverworts pick up for the first time Oh, the anura as well, um, the ascomycata and the basidiomycata. Um, the mosses, curiously, are not mycorrhizal. And um, that's all I want to highlight for now, but keep this in the back of your mind as, as we move forward. So there are two main types of fungi types, of mycorrhizal fungi types. We have the ectos and the endos. Now the ectomycorrhizas, which you see here, are um, ecto because they they colonize outside of the root. This here, what you're looking at, is a cross section of a root. Um, so the ectos are on the outside, and then the endomycorrhizas, and you have the arbuscular and the orchid and the ericoid mycorrhizas, all actually penetrate the cells of the of the the cell walls of the roots. And they have very different morphologies um, and functions. So just a little more detail on each of these groups. Um, the ectos first. So the ectos are, um, although they're only colonizing 2% of plant species, these are really important wood, woody plants that make up our forests. And there are something like, well, over 20, thousand different fungal species in this group. And what do they look like? So when we get close up, and this is about a times 10 magnification, um, you can see this sheath here. It's almost like a glove. And some of them are white, like you see here, and some are black, and some have really fabulous colors, like bright pink. And there are, they can be quite beautiful and, and startling under the microscope. And then when you look even closer, you see thousands and thousands of this filamentous hyphae. And of course, the, this mycorrhizal mutualism is all about nutrition. So this, um, this nutritional symbiosis exists because the fungi are unlocking the nitrogen and phosphorus in the soil bringing those up to the trees, and then the trees in turn reward the fungi with carbon. And that gets us into this, this whole carbon dynamic, which we'll explore later. And the ectomycorrhizas are also our, um, our fungi that produce fruiting bodies, some of which we love to eat, and I've highlighted here. And that's what they look like below ground. And whenever you see this, this sort of dotted line in my slides, that signifies that we're going below ground. Next, we're gonna look at the endomycorrhizas and the most common uh, of the type 
are these arbuscular mycorrhizas, and they're called arbuscular because they have these sort of arbuscules, tree-like structures. Um, this is where it's thought that the exchange of nutrients occur within the cell. And again, we have this nutritional mutualism occurring, but in this case with the arbusculars, they're focusing more on phosphorus, although we do see nitrogen transferring in many experimental systems and we think in the wild as well, um, it's phosphorus that they specialize in. And again, the fungi are getting carbon from the plants. And let's move on now to the ericoid mycorrhizas, which are my area of specialty. Um, you have here their namesake, Erica tetralix, above ground, and then below ground, you have a root, and you can see how the, the epidermal cells are colonized um, with these coils. They make these um, um, septate hyphae coils, very distinctive of the Erica. And finally, or surprisingly, when I first learned this, they're also in our leafy liverworts. Um, this is very handy. Uh, I'll explain why um, I use this, this knowledge in my PhD. And again, here, these are the coils that we see in both the root and the liverwort rhizoid. And then we move on to the orchid, which are specialized mycorrhizal fungi. They too have a very distinct morphology and they're really essential for orchid seed germination and protocorm survival in, in many cases. So now if we pull all four groups together, we begin to have a community. And in most of our semi-natural habitats, we have representations from all, if not at least two of these, even, even in a, a woodland, we'll get the occasional grass and other herbaceous plants. And the same goes for heathlands where you'll pick up some grasses. So you'll have a mix of the arbuscular and the ericoid. Um, or the ecto and the arbuscular or an understory of rhododendrons in a woodland, you will have the ericoid with the ectos. And um, this is um, now um, something that I wanna bring into some of the science research that I'm gonna highlight in the next few slides um, before we bring all of this knowledge into the garden. So this was a restoration ecology experiment that I did uh, for my PhD because we knew that the Ascomycete fungus, Pezoloma ericae, is located in both the root and the rhizoid. We thought maybe this could be used in a way to help facilitate restoration of heathlands after fire. And I, I thought, let's see if we can isolate this fungus and apply it and what happens. So very briefly experimental setup, we isolated the fungus from wild liverwort, uh, from these leafy liverworts, and then we propagated them in culture and we had thousands and thousands of, of these Petri dishes. And then we took either the fungus alone or the liverworts that were resynthesized with this fungus that we were able to identify was the same in both the fungus and the liverwort. And we inoculated hundreds of plants in the Kew nursery, and then we flooded them for 21 days. And we were trying to determine whether not only could this be used for restoration, but would this help with stress? So the, the stress in this case was the flooding. And the results were pretty strong, strongly indicating that this was a viable stress regulator. We have here the two treatments, either fungus or liverwort, having much higher survival rates, the white being alive and the gray being dead, than the control. And now I want to take a look at another type of study, and this is a a large scale, continental scale study, looking at the factors that, ex that affect mycorrhizal community structure. And this was done in, this was published in 2018. They looked at about, I think it was 37 forests across Europe. And they found that the environment and the host explain most of the community structure below ground. 
and in particular nitrogen deposition gradients, uh, forest floor pH, the mean annual temperature, and foliar NMP, um, that's nitrogen and phosphorus ratio in, in the leaves, uh, explain most of the community. And so what's going on here? Well, first of all, if we could think of our trees somewhat as a drill, the way a drill will drill into the wood, the tree roots will be drilling into the soil. And then these mycorrhizal fungi are sort of like the drill bits. And some of them are good for any kind of wood. That's going, going back to the metaphor of the bits. And, and some of them are only good for cement. So some of them are highly specialized and some of them are generalists. And this is very much the same thing for our mycorrhizas. And remember, there are thousands of these. Um, so some of the forests they found um, going along the x-axis here is a um, nitrogen deposition gradient. And they found that sometimes the, the trees that had more of this type of root well, most of the time, trees with these types of, oh, excuse me, not root, um, mycorrhizal fungi, which had these rhizomorphs, these, these thick structures coming off of them, these exist mainly and almost only when the nitrogen was very low. In fact, both of these pictures that you see here were are from roots that we cleaned about a month ago that came from Finland in a very nitrogen, a very low nitrogen almost pollution-free environment, and they're incredible. Um, you can see here in this bottom picture, uh, maybe six or seven different species on one little root. And this is about, um, just for scale, which I forgot to put on, it's about two or three millimeters. Um, so it's quite, quite incredible diversity here. And again, what this study shows, this is this, this forest across Europe, is that the, some trees are very specific um, when it comes to what they can tolerate with the nitrogen deposition. And so this is a little quiz. I can't see you raise your hands, but which, which of these two do you think would be better at, here's a hint, sponging up carbon? And it's obviously this one, not this one. Um, and that takes us to a recent paper published um, by folks in, in the Kew lab, um, Laura Seuss, who runs the mycorrhizal lab there, and Martin, who's also at Imperial. And um, they found that, or they, they talk about these tipping points that are going on in the forest, because the increase in nitrogen is leading to these nitrogen phosphorus imbalances. And as a result, we're seeing more and more of this type of mycorrhizal fungi and losing the more complex rhizomorphic mycorrhizal fungi. And now shifting a bit to carbon and the sort of ecosystem function um, of carbon that everybody's talking about. There are all of these afforestation plans going on around the country, around the world tick that box, plant a tree, and all of our worries go away. Um, this, this study gives us some pause though on, on those theories. So if we look here, um, they took heather, they took heathlands and they planted pine trees and birch trees, four different sites. And the beauty of this study is it gives us data over a long term, which is quite rare in this, this world of carbon calculations. Um, here's a little look at the four sites. And these, um, these graphs show us here on the left, we have carbon stock. And this is four different sites. And they looked at, again, heather, birch, and pine at each of these sites. And for three of them over 39 years, and they measured the carbon below ground and uh, the root system and above ground. And you can see here that the carbon measured in the heathland, the sort of control, if you will, where nothing was done, 
and actually has more or about the same carbon below ground as the birch and, and the pine plots. So I think this clearly tells us that we really need to think carefully about where we plant trees. And this is a dialogue that I think most policymakers are in touch with now, but many mistakes were made already and we have to be really careful moving forward. And this, um, this is just a figure from the report, uh, forest research report that they put out that I like a lot because it's very simple and it basically tells us that most of the carbon is below ground, not above ground. And on that note, um, I moved to some of the research we're doing in the lab. Um, they, there are five projects going on right now that are looking at carbon and nitrogen deposition. Um, Elena and Guillaume very briefly are re-looking at this big European study and trying to get another time point. Um, I'll tell you about this in a moment. This is a Heathland project um, where we're looking at nitrogen deposition effects 10 years later, as well as the effect in below ground carbon. And this is a project that we're doing with Natural England. Uh, it's funded by DEFRA and BASE. And we're trying to determine um, the different carbon loads in different habitat types. And this is all happening at Kew's Wakers, which is great because we could control for climate factors. Of course, there are microclimates, but overall, it allows us just to focus on the habitats. And here we're measuring in sort of a vertically integrated system, the below ground, ground level carbon fluxes and above ground using LIDAR technologies. And um, yes, not just a pretty face that meadow. Um, ultimately, we're looking for an integrated baseline budget of above and below ground carbon and optimizing methods that can be shared and scaled up and uh, providing reference guidelines for policymakers and decision makers and all of us really. So this is underway and we hope to have results in about a year, a year and a half from now. And now completely changing directions, but not really completely. Um, it seems like I'm changing directions. So human intelligences, this is what this is all about. And Vital did all of this work that there are many different ways to account for intelligence. And what about plants and fungi? Are they intelligent? How are they assessing their environment? Do they have um, different senses that, well, we know they have different senses, but would we call this intelligence? And when we look through the literature, um, I, I look often, I go back to uh, Whitaker and ecological niche theory, um, because here he discusses communities and how the different plants and the roots work out who or what is where. And, 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 and he basically comes up with this continuum uh, along environmental gradients as the answer for how communities are working. But are they intelligently communicating? Well, on this question of communication, there are two novel research areas that I wanted to highlight. Firstly, Toby Keir's lab, and she talks about economic models of winners and losers. And, um, and this is all related to fungi, by the way, mycorrhizal fungi. So there are, some of them are competing and some of them are cooperating. And then there's Suzanne Simard, who talks about talking trees and um, hub trees, and, and some of them are super cooperators. And very briefly, I'll dip into a couple of their experiments. So Toby, um, this is a, a relatively recent experiment. She takes these Petri dishes. Um, we have a host root on top and these plastic barriers that keep the roots in, but the, allow the mycorrhizal fungi to go through. And then she labels them with red and cyan um, isotopes. And they started off with 90% and 10% of one and the other. And in a matter of time, they equalize and they correct themselves and it becomes 50-50. 
And so here shows that the fungi translocate nutrients from resource rich to resource, resource poor patches. And these talking trees. So here's a bird's eye view of the forest floor. And the larger the circle, the larger the tree, and usually the older the tree. And using uh, N15 isotopes and DNA tracing methods, she rolls up the forest floor with many, many assistants, and they actually link the trees to one another with both visually and using the isotopes and DNA. And they find that the biggest, oldest trees are the most linked. And then she looked at, she did another experiment asking the question whether the mother trees can recognize their own seeds versus transplants. So they took trees from the mother in forest A, and then they took trees from other forests and brought them to forest A and planted them around the same mother tree. And they found that the survival rate of the seedlings increased four times. This is very interesting research for sure. And it gets us onto this whole wood wide web and communication question area, which is absolutely fascinating. And um, just last week was raised in the New York Times as a possible area of, um, well, doubt, shall we say. So it said uh, decay of the wood wide web. And this was um, based on a, a lecture that was given this summer at, at a conference on mycorrhizal fungi. And um, what the questioners say essentially is that the carbon is really just governed by the need of the fungi. So, and don't ask me to take a position on that. Um, I think it's a very interesting area of research and um, I'm really glad it's getting the attention and it just bodes for further work to understand what's going on underground. And so thus far, we've looked at a number of evolutionary, excuse me, evolutionary um, foundation for mutualisms and the physiology of the plants and mycorrhizal fungal types and responses to environmental stress. But we have yet to look at the ecology and the use in horticulture. So I'm gonna take this now to a very simple community level, our rear garden. And you will see that I didn't go to design school, but I think this will do the job. So I'm gonna plant up this garden with seven plants. Um, they really were fairly random. Um, we need some bulbs in the turf and of course a tree. And now let's look below ground what's going on here in terms of the mycorrhizal partnership. And you can see we have um, two types of endomycorrhizas. Then we have possibly ectomycorrhizal association. There's been one report in the literature of ectomycorrhiza in a related uh, genus to Tracheospermum. The brassicaceae have thus far been called non-mycorrhizal. While they are colonized by hyphae, we haven't seen any arbuscules, which is a sort of strict rule for a mutualism occurring. And then we have cystis, which associates with ectomycorrhizas, and perovskia, another endo. And of course, all of these plants are competing in some way for resources, nutrients in the soil, or their mycorrhizal fungi are competing for these resources. And let's say we get a bit tired of the magnolia, it's been there 20 years, we wanna try something new, we want something evergreen. So we think about uh, evergreen Quercus, we think about, let's do rhododendron. And all of a sudden, we have an ericoid mycorrhizal plant 
in a plant that was mainly arbuscular mycorrhizal. And this is something to think about, of course, because there are no ericoid mycorrhizal propagules in this garden at all. So where will they come from? And remember, moving forward in this talk, whatever happens above ground happens below ground. So should we use one of these products? Most of the products don't list the ingredients. And the ones I found were endo only, endomycorrhizal, nothing for ectos or, or the trees. And some of them are getting very clever marketing to horticologists, talking about the net zero benefits and that you'll get one ton of carbon in your garden. And of course it's safe for children and pets. These folks, they did an extensive study on all of these products. And they looked at 68 mycorrhizal inoculation products and they found in panel A, you can see the number of species. So most of them have only one species. In panel B, you see the inoculates by species composition, dominated by three or four. And then in panel C, um, <clears throat> excuse me. You can see um, mostly arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi, they're 44% of what's in the ingredients, but you have a whole load of other things that you may or may not want in your soil. So the results were there are only a handful of species, only AM fungi, most have other ingredients. And in terms of their efficacy, there were conflicting results. This is a fun study that Disney World undertook to decide whether or not they should use these products. And they tested this in over 23 tree species, containerized and raised beds. They also were looking at whether the trees would behave better in one or other of these two systems. And they found all of the trees were mycorrhizal regardless of treatment. Varied outcomes on colonization and uh, spores and root diameter. And this next study looked at four different trees. Um, they had, uh, uh, if you see the top black dots are the control and the bottom here are the arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi treated plants. And along the Y axis, we have root length. And in three of the four cases, we have the root length being suppressed um, and, and this one is about the same. Um, so that's not so unusual in the early days, the first days when the mycorrhizal fungi colonizes a plant, you might find the roots are suppressed, but this particular study goes on for over a year, well over a year. And at each time point, this was a consistent finding. Um, so again, questionable as to whether or not the products that were used according to the manufacturer's labels were effective here. On um, this next study, I'm going to, I'm actually going to pass over. This is the work of Katie Field's lab. And I think she spoke to you all about this a couple of weeks ago, but similarly, um, she found mixed results in the different cultivars. So should we, or shouldn't we use this? these products? Well, as you've seen, evolution has been at it for millions and millions of years, and these products have been around for maybe 20 years, 30 at, at most. Um, so what I would say is if we are going to use them in our garden, I would test them in a pot. I would test them on one tree in the back, but I certainly wouldn't be broadcasting any of these products across a small garden, because we, we simply don't know for sure what's, how the plant's gonna respond. There were all of these different community dynamics and competition, et cetera. Um, so I would be cautious. 
So one of the things we do know is the more our vascular mycorrhizal spores that are around, the better off or the more likely the plants will be to be colonized and benefit from that natural symbiont. So this study looked at what are the factors affecting our muscular mycorrhizal spore production. And they found pH was a major factor, uh, water content, and most importantly was the depth of the soil. So as you go deeper into the soil, we have fewer and fewer arbuscular mycorrhizal spores, and the top 20 centimeters have the vast majority. So with these things in mind, I'm walking around Q, I was looking for pictures I can share with you. Um, this was this past spring at Q, and this is the annual parterre, um, the annual um, beds that are changed annual, because they're changed annually. And they're typically dug out um, two spits deep. That's about a spade. Each spit is about a spade. So quite a bit deep when they turn them over. And given what we know about the spores, rather than the typical or traditional practice of turning everything, maybe we should consider saving the top, top 20 centimeters and putting that back in for the next season's plants rather than turning over from the bottom and maybe only aerating that every now and again, but keeping those propagules up at the top end of the, of the soil, of the uh, surface. And here is the perennial grass garden going through a facelift. And I was looking at it and I thought, why are they taking everything out? It seems such a waste. Why not leave a few of these hub grasses, cut them down, let them be, and allow for linkages rather than creating these railroad tracks between the plants. So when the new plants come in, we already have hyphae established in the soil and the, the baby plants can benefit, benefit from that uptake. And what about all of our favorite fungal pathogens? What to do? Well, this is, it's a tricky one and it, it depends on your aesthetic, of course. Um, I would argue there's no such thing as a perfect lawn and maybe fairy rings are enchanting. And maybe we need to get used to the black spot because if, if we don't and we spray, then we also get rid of the mycorrhizal fungi. And, and so I think we need to be thinking about some of our traditional maintenance practices and fungal control practices differently. And so just a few common sense horticultural practices, um, decrease digging, uh, maybe look at a no tillage system, at least in the beds where you can do that. Try to think about maintaining these garden hubs to encourage hyphal networks. And remember that top 10 to 20 centimeters dominate where the spores are. Be mindful of competition and cooperation in your design. Avoid adding nutrients because these added nutrients, when we put the NMP in our beds, then the plants are less likely to need the mycorrhizal fungi. And slowly, slowly, they will have um, less function in your garden. Obviously, avoid fungicides. You can remove the thatch on the lawn, and maybe it's time we start overlooking the fairy ring and looking for the perfect lawn. And finally, let's not forget the ecosystem function of carbon dioxide sequestration, carbon sequestration which our, our own gardens are playing an important role in. And of course, above ground impacts below ground. And I'll just leave you all with this beautiful quote, just a few centuries old. And that's it for me. Thank you 
Thank you so much. Um, that was a great talk. Uh, I hope you can hear me. I, my, my my internet's been been sort of cutting in and cutting out, but I think I'm I'm audible and 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 visible now. Um, thanks, Jill. That was some great insights into some um, topics that are certainly so relevant to plants, people, and the planet. So. It gels really well with our, 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 our sponsors and we've got loads of great questions here. Um, so I'll kick off immediately. Um, I mean, the first one you, you've largely answered in your in your talk um, with with the fact that there are mycorrhizal fungi that fruit. But um, can you can you tell us about any of the mycorrhizal fungi that don't produce fruiting bodies or, or rarely produce fruiting bodies i know the orchid ones are one such but sure um well most of the fungi that i work on actually don't produce fruiting bodies and they're they're cryptic in nature they're very difficult to see without microscopes. I mean, the Mucromycotina group, mm. otherwise known as the fine root endophytes, are about one and a half to two microns mm. thick. That's like one one hundredth of a hair on your head yeah. on the hyphae. So, and, and we actually don't know how they're fruiting. Very little has been observed in culture. And they are therefore um, quite difficult to understand in terms of their reproduction. So this is a very this is a wide open field to understand mm. further. Similarly, the arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi yeah. similar traits, and and they're not producing fruiting bodies. Mm. Yeah, this was a bit of a conversation we had with 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 Katie a couple of weeks ago, and this concept of the, the old concept of um fungi imperfecti and all that um so i've got another one um is it only the ectomycorrhizas oh no this is this is all to do with fruiting bodies sorry is i mean i mean this is relevant is it only the ectomycorrhiza um fungi that produce fruiting bodies yes yeah that's what i oh no no i'm sorry so ecto, ecto or basidium yeah basidium and the ascomycete groups which are sometimes ecto so sometimes um they produce fruiting bodies but you won't find those in the endo okay and Another one, the current um, project with DEFRA sounds amazing. Um, this is a question. Uh, who is the best person to get in touch with if we would like to get involved? Um, with the DEFRA project, why don't hmm. you can email me and then I will see what, what the angle is and, and who then best to get in touch with. Okay, thank you. I'm having a bit of trouble seeing the, the questions at the moment, sorry. Um, I know that plant, this is one coming here from an, an anonymous attendee. I know that plant seeds tend to have an internal microbiome including bacteria do you know if endomycorrhizal plants have fungal cells in the seeds or if fungi are known to be part of that seed microbiome it's a really good and fascinating question i it's not an area i have worked on there is somebody in there are a couple of people in the lab at q who are working on that and they're actually using the millennium seed bank seeds 
to establish the communities that are there from the very beginning uh, versus the pathogenic fungi that find their way into the seeds. Um, so if this is a, something you're interested in, please do email me and I can put you in touch with them or send you a paper or two to whet your appetite. <laughs> Okay, the, the questions are coming in so fast, the screen keeps changing in front of me. Um, so I've got one in front of me here. Um, excuse it for anybody who I, I haven't posed their questions to yet. This one is all about biochar, which I think is fascinating in its own right. Uh, biochar, which contains potassium um, phosphate, is suggested by some for tree health. What do you think of this, please, Jill? I haven't studied it enough to form an opinion, I'm afraid. Okay, quick answer. Will organic fertilizers such as fish blood and bone discourage the fungi? Presumably the hyphae and brassicas are doing something. Uh, two part question. Let me start yeah. with an easier one. Oh, well, some, some would consider it not easier, but. The hyphae and brassicaceae, um, it's not a plant family I have studied directly. Um, I think that it could it could simply be that the fungi are, that it's a one-way interaction, that it's not a mutualism. Um, certainly, it can also be a remnant of a long time ago mutualism so that the, the sort of toolbox, we, we call it the mycorrhizal toolbox, um, the, the gene toolbox, it could be that the entry is there, but the functionality is not there because we, we haven't seen the arbuscules. Um, it could have been that it's bred, that uh, functionality has been bred out over time because the brassicaceae have been cultivated crops for so long. Um, tough to say that they are still functioning without looking at many studies and, and testing that. Um, the organic fertilizers, um, fish, uh, chicken manure, etc. cetera, um, I think these are certainly helpful in systems where you aren't able to, if you're trying to grow plants in the soil that is not the right soil, that doesn't have all the nutrients that that plant needs, then organic fertilizers are absolutely uh, a part of the, the big puzzle, right? There's no, there are no absolutes here. Uh, if you are moving towards an organic farming system where you want to rely heavily or almost solely on mycorrhizal fungi, then I would suggest testing the two and beginning to phase out the use of the additional fertilizers mm. and, um, and a watch and see. Uh, every, every garden, you saw the complexity in that one little garden mm. with seven plants. Every garden really is different. Yeah, that, that, that was extraordinary. I, I, I've, I've not seen that and I just hope so. I hope lots of horticulturalists are watching this. Um, Here's, here's a question. Um, uh, plants um, which don't have an association with fungi, are they at risk of going extinct? I mean, it's a tricky question, but do you have an opinion on this? Um, and so it is, it's a very complicated question. Mm. Um, I, I would say that they must be getting on already with their particular root systems that have evolved to enable them to still be here in the in this current world. When we think of um, the brassicaceae in the wild, they are getting on with it. Uh, certainly, it's it's a different question when we think of the wild versus our gardens, of course, which are helped by by people. Um, yeah, I, I think we have to look at each one. It, it's a very good, it's a very good question. I'll have to think about that one first. Yeah, because there, there are a lot of brassicaceae that are doing well in the wild without 
mycorrhizas. So uh, it is a tricky one, but it was an interesting one to pose. Here's here's one that 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 I think relates to to gardeners and 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 the like and composters. Um, and it it's just disappeared off my screen because there are so many questions coming in. Here it is. I've scrolled up again. Could I pick any wild mushrooms to chop and blend into a slurry and apply directly to my vegetable beds? Or is that most beneficial for composting? So based on tonight's talk, you'll see that many of these wild mushrooms are connected to, say, 2% of the plants out there, trees. Um, and so they may be absolutely useless when it comes to, if you're looking at them providing spores or propagules for the, the garden, they won't be beneficial in, in the compost. Um, that, that could work, yes. Mm. But many will be very good for you to eat rather than use for those purposes, your lovely uh, image of Lactarius deliciosus uh, early on in your talk. Um, Jill, um, I don't know whether you've eaten it, but I certainly have, and it, it, it is delicious. Um, but that's a, a cooking aside. They here's, are here's one. They are. Yes. They, they are regularly featured in our household, actually. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Great. They, they, they are one of my favourites. So... Are there plants known to have a lelopathic effects on fungi um, or the other way around? I've no, well, there's pathogenic fungi. I, I have noticed fruiting bodies are very rare under brambles and wonder if there is any allelopathic repression of fruiting. I'm not familiar with any allelopathy uh, from Ramble in particular. It's an interesting question, though, mm. in terms of cooperation and, and ecosystem. Um, I'm not aware of any, and it's not something that's ever come up in anything I've read. Okay. Good. We're, 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 we're coming slightly towards the end of the questions. Is there any resource I can access as an ordinary gardener to know the best plants to put together to make the most of the mycorrhizal relationships. That sounds like a book that needs to be written. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Particularly in the context of what you've told us this evening. Plant planting with mycorrhizal fungi. Yeah. I, I, that, that's, that sounds like a nice challenge. I'm not aware of any book that specifically looks at that question and provides suggestions for, for gardeners. Okay, now here's another practical one. What would be an affordable and repeatable test for people to find out about how the mycorrhiza in their gut to find out about the mycorrhizae in their gardens? That's a great question. The ectomycorrhizae are easier to determine because you can, you can see those with a hand lens, with a times 10 hand lens. You can excavate some roots um, with a small hole 10 centimeters deep around the, the root system, and you can actually see how well they're colonized. Um, with the arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi, this is trickier because it's not expensive per se, but it's time consuming. Um, there is a staining technique that there's a little protocol that I put together that you can look at online um, that uses ink to stain the roots and you know regular Parker pen ink and other chemicals which are not hazardous or toxic in any way. And in a 24 hour period, you can 
clear the cells, stain the cells, and look at this under a microscope. So you would need a microscope. And that is how we determine whether or not the plants are colonized, the plant roots are colonized. Thank you. Well, I think you can get, you, you, I mean, certainly you can get quite cheap microscopes to use in schools now. So um, that may be something you can get for the home. Um, I, I think this is quite an interesting question because it, it, as the um, poser um, of the question says, a little bit different, and it relates to house plants um, often dying or suffering transplant stress, and we lose house plants, then we buy new ones using soil, burn money and resources on it. And um, um, is there something that, that, that we could do about sort of enhancing the mycorrhizas in, in, in house plant pots to ensure their sustainability? Yeah, I love that question. Um, I think, you know, plants in pots are subjected to all sorts mm. of mm. difficult obstacles. And this is yet just another one. And I do think a lot of failures are due to the fact that they're not getting the, mm. the type of nutrients they're used to in the wild. And um, so the best we can do is to try to understand what they may associate with in the wild and, and either consider supplementing. This is, a, this is the time where we do supplement with feed, right? With, with um, MPK feed at times, if we can't find the, uh, a mycorrhizal uh, way. And um, I think that's, that's an area that the horticultural field really needs to consider moving forward because it's it's totally untapped and it's just not yeah it's not there yet no and and it would it would avoid this huge wastage of of potted mm -hmm. plants inside and outside so i think that your answer to the question of, uh, 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 applies to another question about garden plants in pots so i'll i'll move on to what is now our last question? Um, is the, oh no, there's another one coming. But is there any resource I can access as an ordinary gardener to know the best plants to put together to make the most of the mycorrhizal relationships that might be on offer? It's that's similar to one of the other questions. Yeah. And um, at the moment, there's no handbook to garden with mycorrhizal fungi. So uh, again, there's there's an opportunity for somebody. Um, I would just you can easily Google, however, associations known to particular plants, at least plants, some of the plants in the trade, in the commercial trade, go by a different cultivar name. But if you can get the genus and species, you you might be able to find out first. Cer firstly, you can find out which major group they're in. Are they arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi? Are they ectomycorrhizal fungi? That's your starting point. And there's no reason why they can't all be planted together. And um, it's just understanding a little bit more what's going on below ground in order for us to make some useful decisions. I wasn't suggesting that we shouldn't plant a rhododendron in a garden where we have all our buscular mycorrhizal fungi plants previously. I think it's just, it's just a matter of understanding that plants may struggle a little while. Um, this is, it's, it's kind of a balancing act and, um, and understanding why that plant may be suffering a little bit the first few months. Hopefully it came or it was grown in its container with already existing mycorrhizal fungi. So it may be transplanted and have a little, you know, breath of air and then slowly, slowly come on. So just be kind to those plants. Yeah, I think that's a good tip for, for everyone. Be kind to plants as much as you can. And then the final question, um, 
from from a non-expert here i tend to let my garden do what it likes a lot of the time and i have lots of different types of mushrooms every year which i leave to rot down is that a sign of a healthy ecosystem in my garden or not really uh, i like the sound of it i i couldn't say if it's healthy or not it's um <laughs> I, it depends on the, the fungi, but it sounds like you're doing, you're doing all right. Yeah. Unless it's all honey fungus and you've got apples and exactly. pears and it's, they're all being killed by the honey fungus, but you can eat the honey fungus and they taste quite nice. So um, enjoy your fungi in your garden, but check that they're safe to eat, I would say, as a great eater of fungi. So um, we, we have no more questions now. Um, Jill, thank you so much. That was uh, a, 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 a really insightful and inspiring um, thought-provoking thought talk, particularly for, 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 for gardeners and, and, and everyone. And um, so, so thanks on behalf of everyone and um, a big virtual round of applause. And um, good night, everyone, and join us for the the last in our series of of these 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 talks on plant fungal interactions in two weeks. Good night. <laughs>